Welcome to the Internet History Podcast. I'm your host, Brian McCullough. So, uh, this Tuesday, tomorrow possibly, depending on when you listen to this, there's a new book coming out that, quite frankly, every single one of you listening to this is probably going to want to read. It's called The One Device, The Secret History of the iPhone by Brian Merchant. Yes, Finally, a detailed history of the entire development of the iPhone inside of Apple. But not only that, the book is also an extensive history of all of the technologies that came together inside the iPhone to make the modern smartphone possible. Everything from lithium-ion battery technology, touchscreen technology, Gorilla Glass, GPS, digital photography, maps, everything. The author of this great new book. Brian Merchant was kind enough to send over an advanced copy, so I got to read it already. And as you'll hear when I talk to him, I couldn't have been more excited to do so. This is really the book that I've been waiting for for about 10 years. There's a link to buy it in the show notes, but uh, really, uh, go order it now, and then come back and uh, enjoy this conversation with Brian Merchant, the author of The One Device, the secret history of the iPhone. Brian Merchant, thanks for coming on the Internet History Podcast. Hey, Brian. Thanks for having me. So I told you offline, this this is the book that I've been wanting someone to write for 10 years. <laughs> yeah. uh, g- I'm getting the behind oblige. the scenes. Yeah, yeah no, uh, all the little nitty gritty details that y- everyone's just like, I, I know there's got to be a story there. I know there's got to be a story behind this. So uh, it, it's, it's a fantastic book. Um, and... Um, I, I, I'm encouraging everyone listening to go out and buy the one device by Brian Merchant. But well, let thanks. me start. Let me start with really the dumbest question first. Sure. <laughs> which Let's get it which out is of the way. where, which is where the idea comes from. Um, wh- the reason though I'm asking such a dumb question is because it's one that I get all the time in the sense that people are always like, "How can you be talking about the history of something that's so new?" And I'm always like, "But, but, but <laughs> it's." A, it's not that new. You know, this is the 10-year anniversary of the iPhone. But also, more importantly, like, for, for technology like, uh, technologies like this that are so impactful on our lives, like, I always think, why isn't there more history about this stuff? Right. So was that sort of the, the, the impulse to do this book, to uh, tell the story of this super impactful de- device? Yeah. I mean, I think that that's absolutely right. I mean, it's, it's really sort of crazy uh, to think about it. I mean... It did. I mean, 10 years doesn't necessarily seem like a lot of time, you know, in in the technology world, things accelerate so fast, it's it's a little bit different. But, you know, it's, as I say in the book, you know, like, sort of like these paradigm shifting sort of culture and uh, economic and technological shifts, they're usually, you know, they're usually not both sort of rapid and seamless. But, you know, like today it's just kind of like, oh, yeah, we all have, we have a phone. Like, you know, I'll text you. I'll, like, drop a pin. Like, just just go to the pin. That's how we'll find each other at the at the concert. Or, you know, like, I, 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 I'm going to text you. You know, I, I'm going to call a lift. Like, of course, it's just obvious. You know, like, it's, it's slipped into ubiquity and to normalcy sort of so seamlessly and so quickly that... You know, I just kind of had a moment uh, a, a, a couple years ago where I, I lost my phone in a cab and it just kind of hit me that being without it sort of just, you know, everybody's had that moment where you're without your phone and it's just kind of like this like itchy, like ugly sort of like, oh, there's like a disruption in the normal flow. And just the fact that like this this one device can do that and has such power over uh the daily routines of, of such a large subset of the population, uh, it really kind of struck me. And then I thought about it a step further, and I was like, well, wait a minute. Like, I really, you know, I'm, I'm a science and technology writer and editor, and I know the basics 
you know, I, I, I've read the, you know, the, the Apple books and the Jobs biography, but I, you know, I have so little idea about like what really sort of makes this thing tick, how it was, uh, you know, uh, engendered, what the core technologies are and where they come from. So it really started bouncing around in my brain as like this, this idea to like just peel the hood off and kind of go piece by piece and try to understand the, the whole composite of, of ideas and technologies and histories that are hidden within it. Well, you know, that's that's one of the things that I like so much about about your book is, I mean, obviously, I'm going to we're going to geek out on <laughs> on the the back the backstage and the stories of, of, of engineering the iPhone. But in the book, you go into all the, the histories of all of the various technologies, all the components that sort of serendipitously combined to make the mar modern uh, smartphone possible. So, uh, you know, you go into the history of SMS messaging, of Wi-Fi, uh, ARM processors, the story of Gorilla Gra Glass, things like that. So you tell all of these histories of the technologies that had to come together to make a modern smartphone. Um, and was there one of those that you were like surprised you didn't know more about or that, that, that people generally didn't know more about? Like everyone kind of knows that, you know, GPS came from the government, but like, what was the, what was the story that kind of surprised you? Oh man, there were so many that surprised me. Um, I think probably the biggest one was multi-touch, both because it's such a central technology um, to the way that the iPhone works and therefore such a central way, uh, uh, central technology to the way that, you know, tablets and Android phones and, you know, touchscreens in general now work. It's such a, it, it's sort of like the basic language for how we talk to computers now is, is, is through our fingers, uh, you know, besides desktops and laptops, uh, you know, we see a screen that doesn't have uh, a keyboard uh, attached to it. And we think we our immediate impulse is just to, to swipe and to prod and touch it. Um, and, you know, really, I, in, in fact, the whole history of touch technology is really pretty underappreciated, I think. So the more I dug into that, the more fascinated I became. Um, this is a technology that has its roots in, in, in so many different sort of disparate fields that all sort of slowly, you know, coalesced over the decades uh, in, in, in some really fascinating ways. Like, it, I mean, some of the earliest touch technology pioneers were in music, right? Guys like uh, Bob Buchla and, 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 and Robert Moog, who made synthesizers. Uh, inspired before that mm. by the theremin who were just you know uh, which was like a, a field sensing uh, technology and they were looking for ways to sort of experiment with uh, creating music through touch uh, technology and so so sort of that idea started started going and you have a lot of like spillover between academics who are doing both that and then kind of porting it over into computing as it was moving mainstream uh, meanwhile, you have guys like I think the very first touchscreen patent belongs to a guy named E. A. Johnson, who uh, was working at, uh, at you know in an air traffic control uh, sort of research facility at the at the British uh, Royal Air Force, and he was just you know hoping to find a way that was more intuitive. Uh, to sort of direct uh, flight traffic when at, at the time it involved a number of steps that, you know, you have planes entering each other's flight space and it's really, you know, a, a high stakes, uh, risky field. So getting, eliminating the number of steps that you don't, you don't want to have to type out commands and then call them out, enter them into a system. So it really made sense that you could just touch and then navigate a menu. And he really had this very early uh, touch screen. So, and then in the book I go to, uh, to, to CERN, where one of the first uh, sort of the, the inventor claims it was the first uh, implementation of multi-touch um, to control one of their uh, large particle accelerators. So you, you have touch being used to control music, air traffic control, particle accelerators, uh, and, you know, and, and more. I detail there's even more in the book. Um, and it all sort of combines to create this fertile field uh, where where something resembling multi-touch, where you're not just touching one point, but but two, uh, and, and and sensing both of those two or more, uh, and, and sensing that um, Wayne Westerman, who is a really interesting story, uh, he's the guy who's 
company, uh, Fingerworks, was Fingerworks, a, yeah, 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 was acquired by Apple uh, in 2005, uh, and, and the technology that he used actually inspired uh, the team that was sort of looking at this interaction stuff at Apple to sort of take up multi-touch. So it kind of undergirds what would become the iPhone. Uh, and Wayne Westerman's just this really interesting story too. Born in the Midwest, uh, family had sort of, uh, was sort of, a, a lot of his family members had, it, it seems like hereditary uh, disability. And his mother was was bedridden by, by, by back issues. And he, from a young age, had uh, chronic hand uh, disabilities, uh, RSIs, repetitive strain injuries, and tendonitis. So it, but he was, he was also very brilliant, valedictorian, uh, on top of his class. And when he was writing his dissertation on AI, he found that his hands just hurt so much that he couldn't carry on. So he just basically had to invent an alternative keyboard uh, or input method to, to communicate his, his thoughts to the computer. So he came up with this multi-touch pad that allowed him to do gestures that were uh, less hard on his hands. Um, and that, well, let, let me, yeah. um, <clears throat> let's, let's put a pin in that because I want to okay. come right back to that when <laughs> We'll come right back to, to Fingerworks uh, and multi-touch in, in one second when we get into the stuff I'm super interested about. Yeah. But um, like, you, so you go to CERN, you go to Chile, like you really traveled all over the world for this, you know, yeah. uh, tracking down all the components of that. Um, and, and one of the thing, other things you did, because, you know, you're going to Chile and to, to like go to mines where like, you know, the materials to, to make the batteries and the phone are, are mined and things like that. And one of the things that you do to, to, to get at like the root of what, what makes up a phone is you actually have an iPhone pulverized <laughs> to, to, to get down to the base elemental components. <laughs> Right. Did you actually did you actually get to see that process of, of pulverizing a phone, or it was just delivered to you as ashes later on? <laughs> uh, no, you don't. I, nobody could be in that room. Uh, it's very dangerous to pulverize a uh, a lithium ion battery. It, it did, uh, in fact, uh, you know, catch fire uh, in the in the lab, uh, <laughs> which I guess it sort of because I, I, I guess this is to, to, to our knowledge, um, you know, I reached out to a, to a mining consultant and a metallurgist, a, a guy named uh, David Michaud, who uh, runs a mining consultancy called 9911 uh, Metallurgy. And he had it shipped to a, to a lab in uh, Vancouver that does this, that does, they, they usually like pulverize, you know, or to see what the chemical composition is, if it's going to be a good place to mine or something like that. Um, but so they were like, okay, well, I guess we can, you know, pulverize this iPhone into dust to really, you know, get, and we can examine the gases that are escaping um, and really get a count on maybe for the first time the precise uh, composition of elements, like what is actually in this thing. Um, and we were, you know, we were able to like verify a lot of the things. It's the exact sort of weight that Apple specifies, and and it, it was really interesting to sort of break down all of the different uh, different elements and have him look at it and say like, oh, that's that's interesting. Like I I don't I didn't know there would be so much arsenic in in the phone, for instance. Right, but, right. But, but there is. So it's in the it's in the processor, and uh, you know, I think it's vanadium. I, I need the list in front of me, but there's. Uh, a lot of really, really interesting stuff. And it was, you know, it was interesting to see that, like, you know, there's all this talk about mining or reusing iPhone uh, parts and, you know, recycling the bits. But what we found is that the trace materials are so, uh, like the precious metals and stuff are in such small amounts that it's just, it's really not very valuable at all. The whole metals are worth maybe a, a dollar. Right. I'm, I'm actually, I opened the book, I'm looking at the chart, the total value of all the elements in the iPhone is a dollar and three cents. <laughs> yeah, and that's mostly total, the tiny gold, right? Right, right, right. Yeah. The gold makes up the most of it, and it's like 129 grams of material. <laughs> so yeah. Um, right. Yeah. All right. So let's let's do get into uh, my my nerdy geeky stuff here. Sure. Um, so so within Apple, uh, it's the this was this was sort of new to me the the idea of the ENRI group, a group within Apple. That is that starts. They they want to. They're they're tinkering around with new computing paradigms, almost. And um, so they become aware of things like what Fingerworks is doing and multi touch, and and that's sort of sort of the roots of what becomes the iPhone within Apple. Right. Right. 
Yeah, uh, these were guys that were just sort of, they were guys who were, who were younger, kind of ambitious. Some of them had come to Apple because they had this mental picture of the, of the Apple, you know, in the, in the early 80s that was sort of, you know, flying pirate flags and, you know, inventing the Macintosh. So they kind of wanted to replicate that, that ambitious, inventive spirit, even though Apple had, you know, sort of fallen on hard times and Steve Jobs had only fairly recently returned and they were just sort of, uh, the company was just picking itself up off the mat. Um, but they, ha- they started these informal meetings, as you said, under the Explore New Rich Interactions sort of banner where they were like, okay, well, how do we want to interact with our devices? They really thought that we were reaching a point where sort of a saturation point of, of media uh, on, our, on our computers where we were going to want to do more stuff more elegantly than just uh, point and click and navigate through toggle bars and wouldn't it be great if we could directly manipulate data directly manipulate the information with the mouse there's still an intermediary with uh, you know with a touch screen if you could get it to work well enough you could just you know really efficiently close all your windows you know move a you know move a, move a graphic into place you could stretch you could pinch and zoom uh, some of these technologies were already out there in Chrysalis, but they, they started looking at them together. And uh, especially the user interface team uh, that was really kind of like pioneering how all of this stuff might look like together, uh, really like fixated on this on multi-touch. Yeah, like you said, they looked at a bunch of stuff like force feedback mice and sort of like, you know, laser sensing range finders and all kinds of stuff. But that multi-touch was the thing that really, you know, excited everybody as like, a possible future, and that's because a junior engineer had brought in a figure works pad into the into the office, and one of the design one of the designers, uh, Imran Chowdhury, spotted it and said, "Well, what's that? What can what can we do with that?" So they they actually mock up uh, like a table sized uh, multi touch uh, screen device, um, and they, they sort of do it on the DL because they're afraid, you know, if Steve sees it. He might not like it and he'll shut it down. But famously, and this is a story I had read before, um, they show it to Johnny Ive. Johnny Ive waits for the the, the opportune time to show it to Steve. And when he does, uh, as promised, uh, Steve was not impressed. Right. Right. Yeah. So exactly. The, you know, Steve was the decider and, you know, always, always, always was. Uh, and he... You know, would it, and it was it was just that you know if you got showed it to him, one of the engineers, uh, Brian Happy, told me that yeah, it really just was like that. If you caught him on the wrong day or there was a bug, he could just he could just kill it like completely and say it's done. Don't show this to me ever again. Uh, not now. Like it's not not like come back and try again. Just like don't waste your time with this. Don't waste my time with this. So yeah, so Johnny showed it to him, and the details of this are still like a little unclear because I don't think Johnny has commented on it since but uh apparently steve was just like no he was not uh, was not impressed but sort of thought it over over the next couple days and then kind of underwent this transformation where not only did he come around to it but he eventually decided that yes indeed what they were working on was totally the future multi-touch was the best and of course that it, it was his idea in the first place so so it was well, quite, it- a, quite a transformation but it was still it was still almost an idea that was uh, in need of like a reason for being almost and and so when when Steve, this is fast forwarding quite a bit over some details but a couple years later when Steve says we're doing a phone and hey resurrect some of that touch stuff in case we want to use it um, people on the uh, on that original Skunk Works team were kind of bummed because they had all these grand visions of like you know. A computing UI revolution, and mm-hmm. they were sort of like, "Oh, we're just gonna we're gonna throw this on a tiny screen, and it's gonna be a phone." <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, they were. They were. I mean, think in the very, very beginning, um, they were imagining that it, it would be sort of like a, just an input mechanism for for a, a laptop or a desktop. Like it'd just be a pad. It would just be an input mechanism for the for the mouse. Uh, I mean, for the Mac, where you just kind of use your use your hand to to do these gestures and and it would be translated to the screen. Uh, once some of these guys found, you know, sort of said, "Hey, I bet we could do this on a, on a tablet," and that were some of the big. Those were some of the big uh, 
innovation leaps there is that to this point, uh, multi-touch had not been done on a transparent surface, on, on glass, um, in a consumer product at all. So, so those engineers, uh, Brian Huppy and, and Josh Strickon, this guy from MIT, who really kind of like incorporated some research from Sony that was out there uh, and, and, and built this thing. Uh, and again, like you said, like it was, it kind of hit a wall in the tablet product uh, project, kind of, it, it became a tablet and they just couldn't justify it at the time because the costs were too high and they just kind of said, well, we'll just like, you know, put it on the back burner. And then when the time came, you know, uh, when, when the executive staff eventually did convince Steve to do a phone, it was, it was there kind of in this, uh, in this back room still sort of waiting to be, uh, you know, adopted. Well, you know what? The, uh, okay, this is this is an area that I, I'd be curious to get your opinion on. Sure. Because going in, Apple doing a phone, there's there's two strains of thought. Like I've read quotes where people say, "Well, listen, after the iPod, where we we go into this consumer device category and we just destroy it, we own it." You know. Yeah. Uh, we we start to think, well, what other shittily designed <laughs> devices can we can we do that to? But then the other way to think about it is also, well, the iPod is obviously going to be replaced when when cell phones add music to them. So we've got to we've got to disrupt ourselves. In your opinion, what do you think was the main thing that that got Apple doing a phone? Which which of those two tracks you think is is closer to being? Oh, oh, I don't think that they're mutually exclusive at all. I think, mm. I think they are, it's, the answer is both of them, uh, mm. maybe simultaneously. I, I think that you know, the first scenario that you laid out where uh, people were kind of looking around for the next product category, uh, every single person, like probably the area of the most unilateral agreement that I found was that everybody hated their cell phones at the time, pre-iPhone. It was mm-hmm. whether whether they're gathering at the water coolers or in executive meetings, whether or not it's just kind of like, you know, banter. But everybody remembers, you know, sort of being frustrated with their phones, thinking that, like, these things suck, they're shitty. There's so many different <laughs> ways that it was phrased. I had to cut that section because it was just, you know, <laughs> line, quote after quote of somebody going, like, these things were garbage and we all knew it. So I think... That well, and like, also, also, what weren't they thinking of, like, maybe doing digital cameras? Like, I heard they went pretty far in that direction, too. Yeah, there was some talk about doing. I, you know, they had they had a wide range. You know, uh, Phil Schiller has some uh, fairly famous commentary where he just says, like, you know, like we just kind of like went to the list, and you know, they had some interesting camera technology, uh, but I think that phones were just such a, a huge promising market, and they were grow- It was growing so fast that that it it seemed like. You know, because there was this combination of everybody was maybe convinced on some visceral level, some internal level, that they could do better than the phones that were on the market. And then there was this very sort of acute uh, 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 business uh, imperative that was like, okay, yeah, they are improving. We're seeing, you know, uh, smartphones style products that are capable of carrying music. And if you have to carry two devices, you know, you're going to carry your cell phone. So I think those two things combined, you know, the camera could would have could have been cool, but there was nothing, you know, it's not like improving digital cameras were about to kill their marquee product, the iPod at the time. It's mm-hmm. not like those were, were competing product categories. So my sense is that it was really these combined, you know, feed-ins where there was like really this sort of like personal visceral uh feeling that they could do better uh do better phones and then this sort of you know very sort of dollars and cents kind of like look this is the reality like the ipod is vulnerable so when they do decide to do the phone when when steve is convinced or (laughs) decides to do the phone um famously there's there's two tracks of development um the first track is let's just add calling capabilities to an iPod and you know we've already got the iPod like that's that's the early leader because that's seemingly the simplest thing to do and then the second track is well we that multi-touch thing where it's just a screen like maybe that's 
that we'll we'll do both because maybe that's more interesting. But early on, it was the let's just turn, let's just add calling to to an iPod, and and that was what it was going to be at the beginning. Well, yeah, I I'll add that like so that that definitely has some truth. Uh, you, I you I'm going to just rattle through it real quickly because in, sure, in terms sure. of my my research and the interviews, um, the chronology is a little bit different than uh, than has been previously reported. I think so. Mm-hmm. When in the very beginning, when I, when it's you know this, there's that this has been previously reported, but the but the executive Mike Bell had this famous conversation when with Steve where they talked all night and he finally convinced Steve to do a phone and then around that time Steve called uh, Boss Ording, which is one of these you know really brilliant UI designers uh, who I think really deserves a, a huge amount of credit for sort of crafting the the user interface that we all sort of you know swipe around on today but regardless he called him and said you know we're going to do a phone do you like what can you do so he of course turned to this thing that had long been his passion project he had been one of the designers working on the the multi-touch thing so he immediately started getting some scrolling stuff working getting the address book you know looking kind of cool um and then, you know, uh, uh, Scott Forstall came into Greg Christie's office at around that time and said, you know, Steve wants to do a phone, like, and Greg Christie had been a huge proponent of the Newton all those years ago, and he wanted, right. he, he really believed mobile computing uh, was about to collide with the cell phone, uh, or, you know, it, it, this this mobile device was, was on the horizon. So he kind of drove his team to try to, like, create a demo of this. Now, they... They created this 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 demo after this. Uh, I'll, I'll sort of just breeze over that, but there's a crazy story about how they really like threw down on the mat. Steve was threatening them that 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 they're gonna he's gonna give it to someone else because their demo was too scattershot, and they mm. had this crazy two week death march and put together this thing that is basically the iPhone in 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 embryo, what with a grid of icons and multi touch and so on and so forth, but. At the same time, in the background, this uh, the the Motorola Roker pro, uh, program right. had been going on. So they've been this, this, the the prospect that they might do a phone with a multi touch thing had was was sort of in the air. Tony Fidel, meanwhile, who had been on the iPod uh, before, you know, he really knew that there was this multi touch thing going on. He had too been privy to some of these conversations about a phone, so he had a skunk works going. To, to just put a radio in, a, in an iPod. And then he showed that to Steve, meanwhile. Um, then when the Roker flopped, very publicly, very famously, very dramatically, mm-hmm. Steve, was, Steve Jobs was reportedly livid, and he called this all-hands meeting, and he said, you know what, like, we need, to get a, we need to fix this, we need to get a phone out there pronto. So this other thing, which I think is great, which people are really excited about, is who knows how long away. So let's put some of our resources into making this iPod phone. So we took the HI team, the human interface team, over to, to the iPod phone and said, can you just like, can you find out a way to use this iconic, you know, sort of click wheel design to make phone calls in a way that doesn't suck, that is, that, that is pretty elegant. And, and they just spent the next, you know, six months just beating their heads against the wall with this prog- with this problem. How do you text with this? How do you make calls with this? Uh, you know, so so the same guys who have the patent for user interface stuff on the phone that eventually did come out that we all know that we all uh, you know use, they have the they have the user interface patent on this iPod phone too for the design of trying to do predictive texting on the wheel and trying to get right. trying to figure out all that stuff. So it was only after they really kind of, you know, according to some of the guys on that team, they got really close to saying, okay, you know what, let's just do it. Let's just ship this thing. It was pretty much ready to ship. They had, they had the hardware. They had, the, they had a radio. It, it, they made calls with it. They had made, you know, they had, there, there are tons of these things in the basement of, uh, or, 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 you know, or in Cupertino at the time. Uh, so they were actually lying around. It was, a, you know, a sliver away uh of possibility away from from becoming reality um you know i reading it it occurred to me and we can talk about this later when uh, you know uh, about steve not wanting to do an app store but it, it occurred to me that it was 
Because obviously, if you ship something, now we know how people use uh, smartphones. If you ship something that would be shitty at messaging, <laughs> that it would be yeah. hard to you know tap out a text to your wife, like it, 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 that wouldn't fly at all in the modern world. But it occurs to me that like, and I think you say this somewhere in the book that like Steve really just wanted to add a phone to it like it was almost a generational thing to him all right great i've already got this ipod obviously i only want to carry one device and that other device mainly i'm just going to make calls on so it's like we think of the iphone as this you know leap forward in computing but really they they kind of weren't thinking that 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 big in certain aspects right well i mean there's a lot of reasons why they weren't too um, and I think that that position at the time was a totally justified one to have. Um, it, it was uh, a really sort of, it, it, it's, 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 I mean, it's, it's hindsight is, is, is 2020, of course. So, but at the moment, you know, iPod is one of the most powerful, popular, sexiest brands in the world right so the ipod is iconic like people it's it's made gadgets cool basically you know they want to they want to build off that heat and that brand so you have this opportunity to just plug into it like right you don't have to start over on marketing you don't have to you know get the public acquainted with it it's just an ipod that makes phone calls so it it has a certain amount of intuitive sense to it it it, you know it, it it probably you know, would have done just fine because at the time, well, yeah, I mean, I think the texting thing is a really important point because people were already sort of going text crazy, uh, especially but younger, my, my younger point generations. Is, right. Yeah. Steve Jobs probably wasn't, right? Exactly. Exactly. It, exactly. A generational thing. Yeah. Yeah. And a number of folks on that team, uh, I'm sure there are people on the iPod team who are just eager to like, you know, get their version of the product out and, and, and would have loved to have shipped it. Uh, it, it, I would love to get my hands on it. I just, it would, it would, it would just be fun to try to use it. Uh, but, but yeah, no, he, you know, he made the call and I think he's clearly been validated by history. Uh, and you know, there's different tellings of it. An interesting thing is the, in the interview I did with, with Tony Fidel, uh, Steve was apparently, uh, according to his telling was really, uh, really gung ho about trying to get it to work. He just wanted it to work. He was you know, it just, he knew it wasn't working, uh, but he was just, try something else. Try, you know, j- try to get that texting better. So what if you could just, like, scroll a little more fluidly? What all, you know, try all these things. And, and it just, it you know, he ultimately made the right call and said, like, listen, like, nobody is excited about this. Nobody really thinks that this is the, this is the way to go. So he did make the call to pivot back to uh, the, the multi-touch-based uh, platform. Right, and I'm actually going to skip over asking you about that because there's so many great details in there, but I want to save some things for the book. So let me, but let me continue on this, on this almost like alternative history. What if? Okay, sure. So, so again, um, a, another famous um, debate inside this project. Once they decide uh, the the click wheel is not the way to go, we'll do the touchscreen thing. Is then there's the two tracks of the software development. So. In this case, one track is um, to bring, you know, OS X and just shrink it down and, and put it on this new device. And then there's the other track, which is the Fidel track, which, uh, what were they going to do? Something like Linux on it or something like that? Yeah. I mean, they, yeah, they had basic, they basically were just going to port the, uh, the operating system from, from the iPod, which was which they had licensed from a small company called Pixo, um, hmm. which had actually Andy uh, Grignan, who is one of the, the engineers on the iPhone, had worked there before. Um, so again, it comes down to this question of how you're conceiving of this device. Like, is it an accessory? Like, is it a self? Is it, a cell phone has a pretty clear functionality. Um, is it going to be this thing that plays music and makes calls? If so, then a tiny, you know, fast, cheap operating system would have done Mm -hmm. just fine. But all these engineers who had sort of seen what was possible with this new user interface, um, this multi-touch user interface, some who worked very closely with with Boss and Imran and all those guys um, and Greg Christie, suddenly saw the the possibility of kind of 
shoehorning in a whole a whole mobile mobile computer, um, and they were pretty convinced that they could do that given their familiarity with uh, with the, with sort of the the suitable processors at the time, and they just kind of really made a case for it. And as uh, Richard Williamson, the guy behind uh, WebKit and Safari, uh, I, were one of the driving forces anyways, uh, really, you know, he said there were these epic philosophical battles over, you know, is this thing, you know, a tiny computer or is it a phone and an iPod? You know, is it, and they, you know, they won, they, they, they eventually won that battle uh, according to their telling when they, when they could show that with the, with reduced processing power and with uh, the, the tiny scale they could get scrolling through uh, an address book sort of you know paradigm to work seamlessly and it just felt really cool it looked really cool and pretty soon everybody that saw this thing was really it, you know it, it had that sort of magic everybody says that they could see that the magic pretty early on okay one more bit of alternative history <laughs> um, <laughs> sure. with with the industrial design um, team, uh, obviously, you know, I'm sure they had a hundred different mock-ups and, and, and models and things like that. Um, c- correct me if I read this wrong, but, um, so Johnny's, uh, preferred model was called Extrudo because it's based on, of course, uh, extruded aluminum, is that, <laughs> <laughs> right. um, and, and that's, but it looked like it's sort of, again, it came, it, it came from the iPod, uh, lineage like it looked like an ipod mini sort of like a tiny electric shaver but it it it, it didn't feel it, it felt too sharp almost and then there was also the sandwich which sort of is that rectangle with rounded edges sort of like what the iphone 4 would be so how did they end up with the design that that was that that very first iphone design yeah uh well you, it, it, there's this this great sketch that is uh, uh, reportedly one of the very first sketches that Johnny ever made of, of the device and it looks pretty darn similar and I think it was just a matter of trial and error and again they got really close to using that extrudo version you know they had they were working with um, Tony Fidel and, and David Tutman sort of the guy who was really really deep into getting all the all the hardware working um, they had chips in it. They had a they had a prototype, but it just it you know it it it, it was a it was too hard edged. It was too masculine. It was a little uncomfortable to use, and it just you know there's there's that famous anecdote where you know Steve just you know wakes up and one day and says like I just realized it wasn't perfect or I just realized I don't I love didn't it. I didn't I love just, it yeah. I didn't love it and then Johnny's so embarrassed that he had to say it. Uh, which you know it is interesting like it is i mean it again it's one of those things where you're like well yeah obviously you just they said that they wanted it to defer to the screen uh from the very beginning he says that one of his earliest descriptors of it was like kind of an infinity pool and so they sort of reverted back to that earlier earlier thinking and just kind of got out of the way as much as they could given sort of the 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 limitations at the time um so so you said you ended up with something that was more more simple and and sort of less 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 designed like less overtly designed maybe well again i i could go i could talk to you for like three hours and and basically reveal all of the beautiful <laughs> nuggets in here but so let me let me just pick two that stuck out to me that i don't think i'd heard before and and then um we'll start to wrap it up but um uh tony fidel told you that Johnny Ive was uh, maybe pushing to get rid of the headphone jack in that in that very first phone. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Tony said that even before the iPhone, I mean, this was like in the iPod days. He just wanted it to be as you know seamless and as beautiful as possible. So he was fighting for getting rid of the of the SIM card slot, and even you know the the headphone jack was it was getting rid of that was part of the conversation you know over a decade ago apparently so there i mean i that's it's kind of hard to fathom you know what they would have done and in, 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 instead but uh yeah like that's just sort of like that sort of tendency that now is so like definitive of apple was has has largely been there for a long time just mm-hmm. as thin you know 
you know, David Tupman said that, yeah, like that was just like a mantra, like thin is in, like they just, it was a constant sort of struggle and one that he says he enjoyed um, as an engineer, as a, as a hardware engineer, just trying to like see, you know, just going back and forth, like, okay, like, all right, well, Johnny wants it, another like half a millimeter slimmer so what can we do what can we lose you know like what can and going back and saying like no we need to do this we can't you know like there, there needs to be some way that the the signal can get through it has to have a have a have an antenna <laughs> and, 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 <laughs> there's and basic physics involved there's here, basic physics that yeah that, so those are some of the funny uh but yeah no from the from the get-go this has been sort of uh the direction that that they've been hoping to pursue well right and with the headphones it's a a decade-long argument he finally won but um uh, uh, one more nugget and maybe other people knew this um i didn't uh, uh that larry page was the one that suggested that the iphone feature apple maps sort of as an aside like that wasn't they were originally going to do all the apps themselves and then larry sees an early iphone and he's like well why don't you put our maps on there right yeah, I love that story because it's just such like a snapshot of sort of a different era when you had right. two, yeah, like two of the biggest technology companies already. They were already two of the biggest and, and well-known uh, in the world, and they just had a meeting, and it was just like, ah, why don't you throw this on there? Yeah, we'll give you our code, you know, just, you know, we'll, you know, we'll have our engineers meet, and you can hack something out and they're like oh great we'll like worry about the details later like it was like really this mind-blowing kind of like yeah we don't need to sign any contract you know we'll just figure some stuff out we'll put it on the phone uh and this is when you know steve jobs still wanted to you know have all of the apps done in-house when they're when the app store wasn't even sort of a, a possibility before before the first phone was released so so yeah they just you know they just richard williamson uh one of the one of the great software engineers on the team and and Henri Lamaru, I, I believe it was, would go over and just meet with Google and they just like built you know a version of Google Maps, uh, which is it's this great story of collaboration because, I think as some folks at the Verge or something pointed out at the time, it was just like that's like the best possible way to use Google Maps when you're on the go, you can actually touch. And you know, right. and move around the maps and like really interact, and it's intuitive. And you go, okay, I've got three more blocks to go. It suddenly made Google Maps absolutely, uh, or it seemed absolutely necessary. And it was like a huge sort of like, it it, it proved that use case uh, for the technology beyond a shadow of a doubt. Yeah, and it, uh, it, I was gonna. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I mean, no, I no. when I when I talked to like the guy that that founded like MapQuest and things like that, it's like they the people that were pioneering that stuff spent decades trying to trying to prove to people that wait no mapping is actually a super valuable technology and and no one believes you until the era of gps until you have a device in your right. pocket you know right right i i don't know if i actually included this in the book but one of the very first um sort of demos that they made for this uh for the multi-touch uh sort of interaction uh demo for the sort of the paradigm when it was still a projector screen uh you know point blowing down like the uh, an image of the the mac uh uh home page onto this onto a white piece of paper covering uh, a, a finger works pad i don't know if we if we hit on that earlier but basically one of the very first demos that they did when this thing was still beyond experimental was uh, i think it was greg christie who took mapquest and 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 he blew it uh you know into this 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 projector screen and you could go touch this uh, simulation of a touch screen and zoom in on the apple campus and pull it around and that was one of maybe a handful of two or three or four sort of demos in addition to scrolling in addition to just you know, pinching and zooming a static web page that really got people excited about this. It was a it was a map. It was satellite imagery from MapQuest that really kind of uh, convinced Johnny Ive and then Steve Jobs that this that they really had something. Hmm. That's that's a, that's a that's a great anecdote. I'm glad I I butted in there. Um, <laughs> okay, so to to wrap up, like two or three things that again just from from your you know reporting out all of this stuff and 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 all of your interviews. Um, everyone always is 
if if you weren't there, you're surprised that the iPhone didn't launch with the App Store. And famously, Steve Jobs didn't want to do an App Store. Based on all of your interviewing, like what's your sense in the end? What what was the reticence about? Was it was it generational? Was it like, oh, I only do one thing with a phone. I don't want to mess I, nothing. I don't want anything to mess with that. Or or was it the classic Steve Jobs? No, I I don't want users to. I want it to be this perfectly curated thing. Like what is what is your sense about him not wanting to do the App Store? Yeah, again, I think it's both. I think it's uh, a caution. Um, because again, like I don't think it's necessarily short sightedness. It, it it's it's generational. It's sort of conceiving of this device as an accessory, less than a computer, um, from in from the beginning. Um, and it's his classic, you know, inclination for control. Uh, I think some of the some of the some of the more uh, uh, powerful quotes about it that I got were just that, like, yeah, he just he just could not. He hated it when his own calls were dropped on his. Nokia or whatever phone that he was using, he couldn't stand it. So if some bogus app were to, you know, crash and then to drop a call, or if it prevented somebody from calling 911 or something, then that was sort of the worst case scenario. Um, and I had sources describe sort of this effort to sort of convince him that that was a fairly easy thing to work around. Uh, and that you know eventually the, the, the those executive won, but I, I, it's a really it's one of my favorite stories um, in the book because again it's one of the situations where there's this confluence of different factors that that come together to kind of really uh, you know put the pressure on, on the company and you had uh, developers in one corner who were like let us develop for this this would be great you know and they have you know they famously offered it like oh you can make web pages on it and people are like that's not the same you know like let us do let us do real apps like you're making uh so you had pressure from the developers at the developer conference you had uh a step beyond that which is hackers and jailbreakers really sort of having fun with the phone jailbreaking it so that they can make can, they can indeed make their own apps and then actually doing it and like sort of building in like a very demonstrative use case for what these apps would look like and people really enjoying that and this whole subculture springing up around it so you have you can point to that and say like look this is cool and then you have you know executives saying like this is such an opportunity we can you know we can you know make it foolproof we can make it so it doesn't affect the calling capabilities and and yeah oh, and of course we all know you know the the history after that it's the the joke about the iphone is that it's great for everything except making calls so it's like <laughs> you know it's 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 quickly and, I, and some of the interesting stuff that i that i heard about that is uh, people that claim to have been privy to the financial data about the iphone uh was that it was just it was really not selling well I mean, it was only designed to get a tiny percentage of the market, according to Jobs himself, but I, I think it was even underperforming that, and it was sales were flat, they were just until the advent of the, the, the App Store, and then things just really took off, because you could suddenly do all this stuff, you know, for free mostly, and it, the, the phone suddenly just seemed like this like portal to, uh, to a bunch of possibilities that, that hadn't existed before. Well, lowering the price and, and getting the subsidy down helped too. But yeah, that, it, it, yeah. <laughs> that yeah. but but I, 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 your point is, is entirely right. Like that's when it really captured the the, the public's imagination. Um, yeah. All right. So I asked you this, or I mentioned this uh, before we started recording. But uh, again, <laughs> your your sense of so I feel like it's rare that a you know every company spends a certain percentage in R and D. Um, and, you know, Procter & Gamble, you know, famously tries to create a, a new billion dollar product category every year or something like that. But I feel like it's rare, exceedingly rare that a Skunk Works project or that R&D stuff that you, you, you spend all this money on actually pays off in like a product that becomes your company's main product. Like, you know, Microsoft famously spent billions of dollars, you know, creating tablet computers and things like that. But it never paid off for them. Like, do you have a sense of why it paid off for Apple in this case? Because, you know, Apple was small when the iPhone project started, and so they weren't even spending comparatively very much money. Did they just get luck into this at the right time? What's your sense of that? 
part of it is that um, I have a, a nice quote from Evan Dahl, who was uh, one of sort of the junior engineers who worked on the iPhone, um, who then went on and spent some time uh, around venture capital and seeing, and he just said, like going out on the other side, just seeing how much of these breakthrough products are luck when the technology aligns at the right time, like the ARM processor had just gotten powerful enough maybe at the, at that time to do all these things. And, and who knows, there's some sense that, that luck is, is really involved. Um, and I, I, so before I give the full throated answer to the question, I think that I, it's important that I note like that the theme of the book is that none of these things are possible. Mm -hmm. The one device is not possible without these, almost incomprehensibly complex sort of ecosystems of of uh, of invention of work of of you know uh, of histories of technology coming together of people mostly invisible who who work you know in different capacities to make this thing possible and that's true within apple and that's true outside of apple uh but in this case, I think to Steve Jobs' great credit, one of the reasons that it really did become so so uh, successful was that he got carried, he he believed in it too, and he allowed it to consume Apple. Basically, he allowed once this thing got the momentum going. You know, if you look back at it, just this conversation that we've had, you can kind of follow this sort of this project kind of pinballing around Apple, even when it was kind of small from this experimental rig done before Steve Jobs even knew about it to the, you know, linking up with this concept of a phone, getting some of the hardware, you know, uh, validated in this iPod phone project, then getting other e-staff to, and it sort of, so it's sort of once like all of those sort of corners of the company had touched it, everybody had got it, gotten excited about it he he just he did he went for it and he gave them the resources to to really sort of turn this into a make or break product so it gained momentum i think you know he seemed you know he described it to walter isaacson as sort of being in the room when the sort of the variations of sergeant pepper were were being sort of dictated and he you know really deserves a lot of credit for marshalling Apple's resources, you know, really seeing the potential here and, you know, paving the way for it. So I think that that's, you know, I mean, it, if it hadn't have worked and, you know, this, the phone had been a dud and they hadn't have gotten the user interface to be seamless and it just didn't work, it, you know, who knows, maybe that, maybe Apple's done. It, it really, you know, I, as, as Scott Forstall says in his testimony, you know, like you had a roster of engineers on the verge of burning out if this thing didn't like work then you have a whole stable of demoralized brilliant people who could have left the company with and then nothing else you know they abandoned their many of their other sort of prospects to pursue this so i think that whether or not that's like a prudent like lesson to teach mbas or not because it probably doesn't work you know nine <laughs> times out of ten but it yeah, worked burning out time. your company usually doesn't work out <laughs> yeah right <laughs> but they had the right combination of talent they had the right ideas they had the right feed stocks they were in the right place at the right time uh so many things aligned to to, to make it to make uh, this product possible so fi final question um in uh, you know as everyone does when they write about apple like you have a note in there about apple's cooperation and certain people that w w uh, want to talk to you but are afraid because well if there's the ndas they could get fired if they're still at apple obviously they can't talk to you um obviously you want this you hope this book will be the definitive story of of how the iphone was developed but i'm wondering based on the people that couldn't talk to you but maybe wanted to like are there is there still like just a reservoir of great details and stories out there still to be told ab about this period at Apple and the development of the iPhone that hopefully once people do retire maybe they'll start to leak out over the years? I mean, there's always more to tell. I mean, this is the inside Apple part of this book is, you know, maybe a third, maybe a little bit more uh, uh, of the book um and it very well could have been twice as long. Um, 
it, it, it there's there's going to be more that you know little incidental quotes and things that uh, people have to say. I'm sure there are stories that that uh, that engineers still working at Apple have that uh, that they want to tell. Uh, but I think by and large, um, especially the early chapters, I re- I feel like I really got a def- really definitive look. I think I spoke to you know maybe f- five of the seven people who were um in the room when sort of the kernel for the iPod I mean iPhone was planted um mm-hmm. I, I so so those those early chapters about the Henri meetings about turning uh this multi-touch based uh platform into a user interface and then porting it over um and then combining you know with some of the research and stories that about you know uh, Fred Vogelstein's book Dogfight did right right did was 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 a great piece of history about sort of the the um, P1 versus P2 sort of section of the iPhone's development um you know I got dozens dozens of interviews uh from a lot of people who've never spoken before I really I really feel like you know that this is uh, you know a pretty pretty comprehensive portrait of what it was like to be there you know i don't have scott forstall on the record who was the head of the um software effort uh but one of the key themes of this book is that i'm really interested in what the people sort of doing the inventing the people in the trenches are doing less interested in executive politics you have to hit on it because it plays a role in how you know uh teams work together and uh, progress on innovation is made but really the story that's interesting to me is is how these teams you know bounce ideas off of each other how those ideas develop how they you know you know put the work in how they work together how how the engineers have ideas that designers can tweak and make usable by uh by the layperson how the uh designers you know kind of envision this platform and force the engineers to come new come up with new ways to to power it uh those are the stories that i'm interested in um Mm -hmm. and the stories of sort of sacrifice that that people made um and i you know there's this is this this is as definitive uh a book on the genesis of the iPhone as I think has ever been made. And, uh, you know, I'm really proud of all the work that went into it. And I should say, I should add that I'm, you know, equally as proud of looking at the other side of the coin, you know, as you said up top, you know, going into the mines where some of the metals are taken out of the earth, sometimes by very young people in difficult situations that actually form the basis for this device. I think it's important to understand that there are so many hidden histories, uh, so many invisible people doing work that makes these things possible, you know, including manufacturing. Yeah. I I could not, it is a hundred percent the most definitive uh, book on the (laughs) iPhone. Uh, Listen, I, I can't recommend it enough. It's called the one device by brand merchant. It, you know, like I, I purposely, I have reams of other notes here that of, of anecdotes about the iPhone development within Apple that I, I don't want to give away all the good nuggets. But then, like you said, uh, that's only about a third of the book. The rest of it is other great history stories, like, you know, the development of the ARM processor with Sophie Wilson. And, you know, we didn't even mention Frank Canova and the Simon and like where the where the genesis of the smartphone comes from. So listen. Thank you, so, thank you so much for the book. Thank you so much for talking about it. Everybody, it's fantastic. Um, the One Device, The Secret History of the iPhone. Uh, Brian Merchant, thanks for coming on the show and uh, sharing that with us. Yeah, thanks so much for having me. I had a blast. If this is the first time you're listening to this podcast, please subscribe to us on your podcast app of choice. There's plenty more great internet history where that came from. And if you're a longtime listener, then you know what to do to help us out. Rate and review us on iTunes, because iTunes gives credit to reviews and ratings, and the more great reviews we get, the more people will discover us. As always, there's more info on our website, www.internethistorypodcast.com. The show's Twitter handle is at NetHistoryPod, and my personal Twitter 
is at BrianMCC. Thanks for listening.